Hey, friends, thanks for joining us. We certainly do appreciate it. On the line is our friend David Morgan from silver-investor.com, home of the Morgan Report. David, welcome. Well, thank you, Sean. It's great to be with you. Well, it's great to have you. Also on the line is Rory. How you doing, Rory? It's all good over here. Hope everybody's well. Well, that's what you said last time, Rory. You said it's all good over here. Is it always good down there? It's always good. I mean, you know, life is good. Sorry. <laughs> Well, Mr. Morgan, you're out there, I believe, on the uh, West Coast. Is that correct? Well, inland on the West Coast. I'm in Washington State, so west side of the country, and I'm on the Idaho border. How do you feel about this Fukushima thing? Have you been following that at all, David? Are you nervous? I have, about that? yes, uh, not avidly, but I have followed it, and uh, I am I'm very concerned because a couple things I'll uh, comment on Fukushima. One is why haven't the governments gotten together and said how do we solve this you know why don't we encase it like the Chernobyl I don't know if that's viable or not but it seems as if everyone just ignores it and you know they're putting out political pressure don't say anything negative about it or radiation is now good for us or you know you can up the amount of radiation you can uh, have around you by a factor of 10 or 100 or a thousand mm -hmm. and and I, I'm a you know fact-based kind of an individual, and the fact is that so much sea life is dying in the Pacific, that is very alarming. And then on top of that, Alex Jones has done a series here recently on the amount of uh, radiation on the beaches up in the Northern California area, whether they could directly be correlated to Fukushima or not. I guess you'd have to be open-minded and so say you couldn't exactly do that, but they're coming from somewhere. Yeah, I'm nodding uh, in agreement because we've we've written about this to some extent that w we're horrified by the exact same thing that you commented on, which is where are the governments of the world? Why isn't there outrage around the world and why aren't governments getting together with, you know, the very best and brightest minds, the very latest and best technology and a money is no object sort of attitude on this thing to fix it if it's fixable at all. And uh, it just scares the hell out of me that they're leaving this in the hands of the very inept company TEPCO, which is really at the heart of the problem from day one and uh, and everybody's just acting like well Tepco can uh, fix this with homeless people they grab off the off the street it's just it's scary as hell because it seems to me that uh, you know with humanity sort of hanging in the brink here you know the governments around the world the United Nations people should band together and, and get over there and try to fix this thing if it's fixable but but I don't think that I don't think they can encase it like they did with Chernobyl because there were some reports that were that were coming out a few months ago maybe even as long as a year ago that it was actually melting into the earth and so i think that and that there's been very little reporting on that but i do distinctly remember reading an article where there was there it was actually going into the planet and so as far as encasing it and i think that that's why they have not encased it otherwise that would be the answer but they they haven't done that there's a reason they're not doing it and I think that that may have something to do with it. Yeah, it's quite possible that they've lost control entirely. And uh, Rory and I are working to get some folks on. Uh, if anybody has any ideas about exactly who we should be talking to, we would love to uh, have you leave those names below. We know of Arnie Gunderson, but if there's any others that people think highly of that can really give us the brass tacks on what's going on in Fukushima, please leave those names in the comments section uh, below, and we're going to try to explore this issue in much more detail in the future. Of course, David, that's not why we have you on, because you are a silver and precious metals expert. So I wanted to ask you a little bit about your precious metals update and predictions for 2014. And uh, I think a great way to lead off with that is to talk about the precious metals flash crash that we saw last Monday. Uh, Andy Hoffman has noted that it's the sixth time in four months that the COMEX had to close briefly gold trading because of a lack of liquidity. And somebody threw 4,200 contracts at the market. That's $500 million worth of silver and literally repriced gold $30 in a moment. You know, where do I stand on the manipulation? It, the market is manipulated. I also believe that most of the markets are, including the stock market, the bond market, the interest rate markets. I mean, plus a lot of this is factual. I mean, a LIBOR scandal with interest rates. Coming back to the metals, um, you know, it's really um, upsetting that n n nothing ever happened with the CFTC investigation, but I was of the belief system, unlike some of my... Um, you know, peers, that uh, anything through the officialdom would be done correctly. I mean, I just am 
I guess, so chided and uh, disillusioned with what's been going on in governments globally and specifically in the United States of America, that even if they found something that would prove manipulation, that they still wouldn't do anything about it. Yeah. And this is the case. I mean, Butler did a good article recently about um, the limits, and I've talked about it many times. I might, in fact, talked about it before him. doesn't matter. The point is that there are uh, delivery limits. And um, and uh, J.P. Morgan, you know, exceeded those limits, but, you know, ho-hum, no one says a darn thing about it. Coming back to the flash crash, these can be shown again and again and again, and there's only one reason to sell a lot of something, and that is absolutely to drive the price down. So that's a proof. I mean, I think that that could be proven mathematically. I think it could be proven by common sense. If you're going to buy something uh, and bid the price up, it's because it's scarce. If you're going to sell something, there's a lot of it. It'll drive the price down. That's how all markets work. So these things are constructed and delivered at appropriate times. And then, uh, again, the CFTC or the governing body or the regulators or whatever just basically turn a blind eye to it and act as if it's, you know, normal market activity when it's anything but. I don't stress about it too much. I know one of the main questions I get, so I'll ask it for myself, Sean, if you don't mind, and that is, well, if these markets are manipulated, why would you participate in And there's really one reason, and the reason is that physical doesn't equal paper. It's that simple. Mm -hmm. Everything that's done in the futures markets is a derivative. Certainly, there is metal backing some of those contracts, but it's minuscule. If you look at all the futures markets, not just the silver market, although silver is an exceptional case, it's at the extreme, you will find that there's only about 1% to 1.5% of any commodity delivered versus the amount of contracts that are outlying. And that's why when someone writes to the CFTC and says, well, you know, there's only this much silver, but there's this many contracts, uh, you know, this doesn't add up, they, they ignore it because from their database, from their experience, it's, well, who cares? There's only about 1% that's ever delivered anyway. But you know what? That is the normal factor. That's not the tail end of the curve, and that's not the event that could happen. Um, I just want to go on, if you don't mind, and that is, you know, this thing that I've said before, and I probably didn't qualify it correctly, but the one thing that cannot be predicted is human behavior. Now, you can predict human behavior very accurately a lot of the time. In fact, that's what long-term capital management was all about. It was all about predictions on a very strong algorithm that could equate what should take place in the future based on the data input, and it was very accurate until it didn't work. Why? Because when the Russian ruble was going crazy, the math said that it's going to recover, and it didn't, because you cannot predict human behavior 100% of the time. So I made that point to make this one. That means you cannot predict when you're going to have enough physical demand to blow up the CME, or when someone's going to stand for delivery. Now, you can stand for delivery of gold, which is a very low level right now, and the CME would say, well, sorry, you got to sell for cash, read your contract. All that's quote-unquote legal. But I think that's in a, a broad message, and it might be enough, because you've got Germany not getting their gold back, or they're going to get it back in seven years. And then if the CF, CME forced a uh, cash settlement for gold, for example, and you add that on to what's already going on with Germany, you add that on to you know, running out of gold coin manufacturers, you add that on to everything that's happening in the physical realm, that might just be enough. These things are additive. They're, they're synergistic. And there's some point, and I don't know when it is, but it could be as early as this year, where something will take place in the physical realm that will take control. doesn't mean the CME is going down. It could. It's more likely, in my view, that what you'd see is a two, two-tier two system. Mm-hmm. You see this derivative price where what do you get? You're getting a piece of paper that's cash settled. Mm-hmm. Do you want to play that game mm-hmm. or do you want the real thing? Oh, that's a 20% premium. Yeah, I'll pay 20% premium. <laughs> why? Because it's real. That's yeah. why. Well, you know, the COMEX is down to only uh, about 416,000 ounces with 63,000 ounces having left registered, according to Harvey Organ. Uh, just this past week. So, I mean, that's barely uh, $500 million in gold, which incidentally is the same uh, number, fi- about $500 million that they threw at the market that last Monday with 4,200 contracts, and they repriced gold 30 bucks in an instant. And, um, you know, the only people with pockets deep enough to do that would be the Fed, in my opinion. And it's funny that uh, as you look at that and step back, it's like, well, why, why would any seller of gold want to throw it 
at the market all at once at market price. To your point, David, it's obviously to drive the price down. Now, I think we need to talk about your predictions for silver here in 2014, because to me, they're kind of exciting. After nothing but a painful beating for the past two, two and a half years here, um, you are writing, and I want to quote it here. I wrote it down. Where did I write it here? You wrote here in the last Morgan Report, David, our view is that silver needs to work its way back to the $30 level, and at this time, it may take nine months or so to achieve that level. Well, that's pretty good news for holders of physical at this point, because that would be about a 50% return, getting us back to 30 in 2014. Do you think that's realistic? Tell us your views on silver and gold here in 2014. My view is that we're going to have a good year, but not a great year. Uh, if you go back and look at the beginning of 2013, silver was about 32 and gold was around 1,700. Uh, I'm not a big believer in cycle theory, as I said in the report, or uh, s symmetry of charts, although there is some argument you can make about that. But if you were to have a symmetrical chart um, for a two-year time frame and you went from 32 to 20 to 32, it would scoop out a great big... Uh, uh, bowl type of formation not that and now I'm making sense here to listeners and not being able to chart it for you not that I'm a big chartist although I use them and the point is that it's going to work its way higher the main thing to look for for all of the Momo players the momentum players for anyone out there that um, does some leverage or not but wants to get reassurance that things are back moving the right direction you want to look at the critical breakdown point the critical breakdown point for silver is 26 and about roughly 1550 on gold and this as you just stated sean was when a massive amount of derivatives were sold at those levels both those levels had held for both the metals for quite some time in fact for silver, i think it was four or five times yeah, that's right. and then um in came these sellers massive amount of derivatives sold for one purpose and one purpose only to drive the price down that broke the psychological back a lot of this is psychology yeah. there's a lot of people out there that probably wanted to buy silver when it was around 26 that said, you know, silver's a good thing or gold's a good thing. And then after it dropped, where it's a better buy, psychologically, they don't have the fortitude to do it. It's like, oh, man, it's at 20 now. It's, it's never coming back or the bull market's over or whatever the mainstream mass is throwing out there. So I think we're going to be able to work our way above those levels. Those are the critical levels to look to. Uh, it doesn't mean when silver gets to you know, 27 that it's done because it might have to test that level a few times. But once it gets above the 26 and gold above 1550, that is as much assurance as you'll ever get that the bull market is still intact. And then I think, again, it's going to go beyond that. I am looking for $30. And I do have throughout the black swan thing. I know I say that in every interview, but it's important to me because I don't want to miss it. Well, and that gray, is... Yeah, you note the gray swan in your latest report, which I think is yeah. an interesting turn of phrase. Yeah, well, you know, and again, not trying to be cute, but I, I did, you know, maybe I coined the term, maybe not. But look, there's so much out there that is on the edge, and it just needs a little bit of extra wind to blow it over the edge, off the cliff. And if any of those events happened, then you could see these metals take off. I mean, you've got the Mideast that's ready to blow up. You've got the Syria thing. I mean, you know, the administration obviously want to go to war there. And then, you know, Putin, of all people, comes in and basically quashes that. You've got uh, financial markets that are in total disarray. I mean, since the 2008 crisis, nothing has been fixed. It's actually gotten worse. And yet you hear this nonstop drumbeat about recovery, recovery, recovery. And there is no recovery. And they know it. And I know it. And you know it. All your listeners know it. And yet there's probably some people, and there's some special cases where somebody's business is doing better or they sold more cars or something like that. But overall, the real economy is not improving. So all of these things combine. And again, it wouldn't take much to tip something over. So that could take place in this, you know, in this year but if that doesn't i don't see it no one can right that uh so i just want to be you know some well you know it takes off and, and yeah, that's why i do what i do i mean part of what i do is timing and part of I, what I, the way i trade is and i don't know if it's unique but i don't know many that do it i let the market tell me when they get in basically do i get it right every time no but i make the market prove to me that it's going to go up and that's the best way because it takes your emotion and your thinking out of it. So if I get that signal and the market tells me, then, of course, I'm going to put out an update. I'm going to put out an alert. I'm going to put out a video. I'm going to do that, whatever I need to do for my members so that they know as soon as possible, you know, if the market conditions have changed. They've changed as of, you know, right now.
Right. Let me ask you this mm-hmm. before I turn it over to Rory, who I know has prepared some questions for you. Um, many mainstream pundits are predicting sub thousand dollar gold in 2014, and it's really ridiculous because in a world with you know one quadrillion dollars in derivatives and central banks having gone all in with this Ponzi scheme, with what essentially at this point is a busted flush, because everybody can see how transparent, what a ridiculous Ponzi scheme this uh, international monetary policy is. What could be the mainstream media motivation? for these ridiculous predictions or or will they be right because guys like Jeffrey Christian you know they can see the hand of the opponent they know what's going on because they know exactly what central banks are going to do they know exactly how much paper is going to be thrown at the market uh, they're kind of in on it in my opinion but ultimately what could be the motivation of these pundits to predict sub thousand dollar silver and do you think it's possible well it's always possible the motivation is to get the last week sisters or weak hands to cough up what they've got I mean, it's a, it's a psychological warfare is what it is. It's just opinion, not fact. And that's what it is. It's like, you know, those guys that are on the edge, it's like, well, you know, I actually bought my gold at, you know, 550 mm-hmm. and it's at 1200 and I don't want to see it go to 1000 mm-hmm. Ah, I'm out. Mm-hmm. And so that's what it is. It's to, get the, it's to get the last weak hands to cough up as much as they can. Yeah. Whether it'll get there or not, I doubt it. I think there's a Chinese put in the market, which means that anything under 1,200, China is going to continue to buy. You're correct about you know these derivatives writers in the over-the-counter markets that have inside knowledge as far as part of their business, you know, to know what the miners have got and they know what over-the-counter derivatives uh, are, you know, in play and where they think they might go. And then there's, of course, this thing called Delta Hedging, which I'm not sure I could do really well on the radio, but basically if you have a losing position, you got infinite money, you just keep adding to it until you force the market in the direction you want it to go. And, you know, for years and years and years watching options expiration, you could set your watch to it. Every time you had options expiration, you get these big down moves in the market so that all the option riders made money and all the public that's usually going long lost money. I mean, you could have an option in the money three days before options expiration. And then, you know, on the day of expiration, these things are get clobbered. Occasionally now, that's not the case. And I think they do that deliberately um, to make it look better. But, you know, again, all this stuff's been investigated, and, of course, there's nothing nothing worth prosecuting is what they said. I want to be fair. They didn't say they didn't find any manipulation. They said they found nothing that they could make this hang their hat on. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and perjury, according to uh, the government, is, is not worth uh, pursuing either as far as, a, as far as a crime, even though the attorney general himself uh, committed perjury. But that's a story for another day. I wanted to go back to the the flock of uh, black swans that you listed just a minute ago, David, and I actually want to add one to it. And uh, Jim Sinclair recently announced that he was taking a senior level position in the new uh, Singapore gold exchange. Dubai and Russia have also announced that they're going to open up gold exchanges as well. And all of that, all three of these markets are supposed to be opening up this year. Now, with everything that you listed just a moment ago, and now we've got three new exchanges that are coming in. They're not futures. These are all physical metal exchanges. What effect do you see or do you believe that that these will have on the COMEX and the LBMA? Well, over time, we'll make them more and more irrelevant. That's point number one. Point number two, I think bigger, is looking at the geopolitical scene is uh, from my the input that I get, it seems a lot of people think that this new world order is a fait complete almost, and that's this what I call the Anglo-American axis, which is basically the London New York consortium, have it locked up. But it's anything but true, as far as I can tell. And I wrote about this in the Morgan Report several months ago. There's a economic war going on between China and Russia, and some of the the BRICS versus the Anglo-American access. And as corny as it sounds, he who owns the gold makes the rules. And China, as we all know, has been importing gold like crazy. And they also, you know, everything they mine goes into into the vault. They don't export any gold. So we're coming to a point, I think, where there is a group that's been in control for a very long time, and they're so arrogant, so much hubris that they believe that, you know, they're going to march on, and if they don't get their way, they'll probably start a war. I mean, I hate to say that, but that's the way I see it. And so that's why you might see in the future where there's going to be some kind of um, situation 
which one already exists between China and Japan, where all of a sudden there is this war, and it's the pretense is something, whereas the reality is it's really an economic war for who's going to be the kingpin that has the dominant currency or the dominant economic clout to basically control the world. Again, I call them as I see them. So this thing is anything but settled, and unfortunately for us, you know, peons, us pawns, we uh, don't have a lot of control over it, but speaking the truth has a lot of merit, believe me, and things can change. Uh, you know, non-participation is a good way, <laughs> but um, that's how I see it. That's the big picture, Roy, so that's, and it upsets me greatly, by the way. It does me too, and, and I, I really, part of me is very excited about the fact that there's going to be a total of four new markets. You know, you, we've already got the Shanghai Gold Exchange, and now we're going to have Singapore, Dubai, and Russia. So we're going to have four that are presumably outside of the uh, Rothschild's clutches that are going to be uh, trading in gold and physical gold at that. And they're all going to be trading in physical silver as well, not, not from the get-go, but they're going to be adding that as well. And I think that I personally think that they're going to have a massive impact, an immediate impact, once all four of them are up and running at one time, or you know, once they all four come online. I mean, because it's four to two, and whether or not the Rothschilds do, in fact, have their clutches in, in these new markets or not, I you know, I don't know. I, I'm just not. I haven't seen or heard anything regarding that. But uh, moving on, I wanted to uh, ask you one other question, David, and that is, um, I was listening to Silver Doctors, and they were saying that the Mint, the U.S. Mint, started allocating silver, the sale of Silver Eagles, in December. They're going to continue that in January, and not only are they going to continue it, they're going to lower the weekly allotment by approximately one-third. And some, according to the Silver Doctors, some of the approved uh, dealer wholesalers are already sold out for the first several weeks of their allotments. I mean, and, and that's not even, that information's not even out there at this point. This was, a, this was on Saturday uh, is when I was listening to this. And also what they were saying is that the main supplier for the Mint is not even selling any silver at the retail level because they're struggling to provide silver to the mint. I don't think, and that combined with the fact that the mines are all shutting down, where's the silver going to be coming from? Okay, great question. A couple thoughts. Uh, one is, uh, you know, with the current silver price, there's there is going to be less production. Two is it could be the grade of the planchettes or the blanks. Um, it's not necessarily meaning there's lower silver supply, although let me go on record saying I believe it is lower silver supply. And guys, let me remind you, uh, the Rio Tinto collapse. Remember when the Kennecott mine collapsed? Wasn't that less than a year ago, David? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that took, uh, what, 16% of domestic silver mining supply offline, and yeah. that mine is still mostly offline. I don't think they're mining any silver. So, uh, again, I just want to jump in and say I think what, what Rory just described with the U.S. Mint speaks directly to the 100 to 1 or more paper Ponzi, the 100 ounces of paper to every one ounce of physical. We can see the COMEX is down to 416,000 ounces of physical gold backing all of the paper Ponzi, and it just speaks to the heart of the matter, in my opinion. Sorry to interrupt. No, that's good. So it could be a, a planchet problem. I doubt it. I think it's more of a silver supply problem. The other thing that most people don't know is that the uh, the um, act, I forget the exact title of it, that uh, initiated the Silver Liberty is actually the title. It's not Silver Eagles that we all refer to them. Was that you had to buy, you had to use domestic silver to produce right. them. Yep. And, of course, there isn't 40 million ounces of silver mined in the U.S. anymore. <laughs> and that goes to Sean's point he just made. So how did they do that last year? And obviously they had to get it from somewhere. But, you know, and I don't think the law has been changed. I certainly haven't seen it. And, you know, I pay attention to stuff. And if it had someone in my, you know, following or peer group or, or whatever, it would probably have alerted me and everybody else and written an article about it. So, yeah, the markets are getting tighter and tighter. And I want to add on to this point, Roy, 
And that is, you know, if one of these black swans were to take place and the metals took off, and this could happen this year, next year, year after, whatever, and you're a major coin dealer and you have some inventory and the paper markets explode, are you going to sell your silver and gold for paper? No, you're not. You're going to close your doors and put up out of business, close temporarily. <laughs> I, it, aren't you? I mean, yeah. this, is, this is pure logic. So, you know, I go back to Greg Hunter, which I imagine you guys know, and I've done a couple of interviews with him, and he started making the, the idea that either you own it or you don't own it. You know, he's, he's discounting the price somewhat, saying, geez, if you bought it at 30 and you're upset, but you own it. Because there could be a day where it's, you know, 25, 50 one day, and then the next day one of these things happen, and you can't buy it at 50, 60, 70, or 80. Now, that is a rare case, but remember during the interview I talked about the rare case that you cannot plan for that does take place in human activity. Again, I'm not predicting this. What I am trying to do is get people to think and think critically and think deeply because there is a case to be made. Either you own it or you don't. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, we've been... Uh... We've been singing that song for many years. It's really the last thing to hang your hat on. You know, when, when the powers that be have all the power of manipulation and there's no force of law, there's no rule of law, there's no recourse to stop them, there's no recourse to put these men in jail uh, who have really stolen the markets and stolen uh, a fair market, have stolen a, an honest market from the people. At the end of the day, you either own physical, you either have it in your possession, or you don't. And I think you're absolutely right, David. There's going to come a point in time when this paper Ponzi finally collapses. Everybody's a little shocked that they've been able to stitch it together this long. But when it does finally collapse, if you don't have physical, you're going to be screwed. And that's that's not hyperbole. That's just a fact. It's going to be out. That That's part of, of my fear with the with with Bitcoin, and I know that that's in a different vein altogether. But that's still that's a digital. That's even to me that's that's worse than paper. I mean, if if I've got paper, I, at least I have something I can at least start a fire with, or or pin to a you know a carrier pigeon and get a note to somebody. But with a digital currency, and I then I wrote this in a, in a comment uh, the, a couple of days ago with a push of a button, and with digital currency you can become incredibly wealthy, but also with the same push of a button, you can disappear financially. And that's what is that's what I see happening with the uh, COMEX and the LBMA and their whole that whole scheme that they've been running over there. It's just it's just a tragedy, but anyway. I like your point about digital push of a button and then you're broke. Um, well, David, before we let you go, we really do want people to know how to get the Morgan Report. Now, I know that people have been really beat up in the precious metals and the mining stocks. God knows I have been. Um, why don't you tell people a little bit about the Morgan Report and let them know how they can sign up? Uh, the easiest way is to get on the website. Just go to themorganreport.com. You can get our free weekly update. Um, just uh, it's the usually get a pop up if you're there for the first time. And if not, on the left hand side, you can subscribe to the free e alert. On the paid member only portion, there's three levels of service: a basic, an intermediate, and advanced. Yeah, there's a pull down menu on the right hand side of the website. There's a video that goes along with each one of those, and there's a 30 day free trial. So basically, if you sign up for the free service. The first email that we send you says, you know, welcome aboard, glad to have you. You can opt out anytime you want. And if you'd like to try the Morgan Report for 30 days for free, we give them the intermediate service, which allows them to see all the videos because I take my team with me on a lot of these shows that we do. And some let us film and some don't. But the ones that allow us, we, you know, we'll do interviews with mining executives. We'll do interviews with uh, other newsletter writers. We'll do, and then I do these personal ones with the market showing me the bond market, the dollar, stocks that we follow, stocks that we don't follow, uh, indexes and stuff like that. So there's a lot to it. I don't know anyone else in the industry that provides the amount of content that we do for the price that we use. Well, David, thanks a lot. You've always been so kind and uh, generous with your time here with us. We sure do appreciate you visiting with us and the audience here at SGT Report. Do you have any advice for folks uh, in 2014? Any last words you want to leave us with? Yeah, I do. That's something that I've used as a, uh, an end statement, you might say, in some of the videos I've done. I haven't done for a long time, but it's three things. It's get real, which means get real with yourself. Get real with reality. Buy real. So when you're buying, that's relating to the metals primarily. And be real. You know, be real, again, with yourself, with others. 
have some integrity. You know, the only way we're going to win is on an individual by individual basis. So I want you to get real, buy real, and be real. Yeah, well said. Beautiful. Well, well said. David, thanks so much for joining us. Guys, do check out the Morgan Report at silver-investor.com where you can find the one and only David Morgan. Uh, David, thanks again for joining us. We do appreciate it. Okay, bye-bye. See you later, bye-bye.